Hi, everyone. If, you, if I can have your attention, please. Um, so welcome this evening. Um, before we get to uh, why we're all here, uh, if you can please take out your phones and either shut, shut them off or put them on vibrate um, so we don't have any interruptions during the lecture. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so this evening we're very excited um, to uh, see some work uh, and listen to um, work from Studio Rosachard. Um, and we're going to be uh, hearing from uh, Don Rosenhard, um, and um, <clears throat> we're going to see a bunch of, or hopefully a bunch of interactive projects um, that deal with the synthesis of architecture, um, people, um, and technology. Um, Dan um, was educated at the Berlag Institute, uh, as well as the Academy of Fine Arts in the Netherlands. Um, the studio has won numerous awards. Um, <coughs> from the uh, D Dutch Design Awards um, to the Design for Asia Awards, um, China's Most Successful Design Awards, uh, as well as Charlotte um, uh, Kohler Award. Uh, they've exhibited their work all over the world, including uh, Tate Modern, Victoria Albert Museum, um, as well as uh, the National um, uh, Museum of Tokyo. Um, and in addition to that, we're going to see hopefully a series of projects uh, that Dan, uh, Don is going to show us. Um, <clears throat> one uh, hopefully is Dune, uh, which is an interactive uh, project of light and sound uh, that's been put in multiple locations um, from uh, underground walkways uh, to uh, riverbeds, uh, river, river uh, sides. Uh, in addition, we're going to see some interactive architectural skins that work on various scales. Um, going from the human scale uh, to the architectural scale. Um, and we're also going to see the very inventive um, um, <coughs> uh, dance floor project um, that is uh, basically the dancers, as Dan will explain, um, uh, energy is extracted from them through a soft floor system uh, and turned back into the building uh, to uh, house um, all the electrical requirements of, of the dance uh, building. Um, so these, all these projects, um, sort of in the vein of uh, people we know and study, like Cedric Price, um, Buckminster Fuller, uh, who look at participatory architecture as a very important aspect of the work, um, and the idea of interaction uh, between space and the uh, user uh, will be a focal point of the project, um, projects through ideas of technology um, and, um, and ideas of uh, challenging notions of architectural space uh, as we traditionally know through walls, floors, and ceilings. And these projects will hopefully, uh, for us, and I'm sure they will open up a whole pos uh, varied and diverse set of exciting possibilities in, our, in the discourse of architecture. So with that, I would like to welcome Don to the AA. Thank you. Thank you. Super nice to be here. Uh, I've always in, in, um, visited this, this institute with a lot of pleasure. So it's uh, it's great to be here to share some new project and uh, hopefully in the end uh, exchange some ideas about the future of design and the future of architecture. It's funny because when I'm giving lectures, I'm introduced in a variety of ways. Sometimes as an artist, sometimes as an architect, sometimes as a designer or as an inventor. Um, my most recent encounter in this was that uh, within a material manufacturer I was introduced as being a hippie with a business plan, <laughs> something which I uh, could really appreciate it as well. But it sort of shows that we live in a very hybrid world um, where uh, strict rules don't apply anymore. Uh, new ways of dealing with reality has to be, have to be explored. And what is the meaning of architecture and what is the role of the architect within that? That's exactly what I want to talk about tonight. And to start with that, um, <laughs> I want to show you this incredibly fascinating image, which I experienced a couple of week ago, weeks ago in uh, China. This is a, 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 panda, a panda area. As you know, what cows are holy in India, well, this is what pandas are for uh, China people. They give them as, as gifts to other governments, and they train them, and they raise them. And what you see here is uh, two pandas being set into a lot much, much larger uh, area. Um, and in order to make sure that the animals gets, get not used to people anymore, the caretakers start to dress 
as panda bears in order to have this transition go more smoothly. I think this kind of uh, state of schizophrenia um, uh, illustrates in a way how I think today reality is looking like. As we live in this over-digitalized world, a la Facebook, a la Hives, our world is sort of shifting from analog to digital. Uh, we're increasingly um, connecting our motions much rather to a virtual thing, uh, somewhere high above uh, in, in a sort of cloud type of setting, than rather to a physical thing. But at the same time, it's also we live in an econo economical crisis. Uh, an existing protocol is crashing, and nobody really knows for sure how to deal with that. And I think that's an incredibly fascinating task of today. How can we merge this virtual and this real world together? And how can we create new values uh, about interactivity, about sustainability, but also yeah, for you young boys and girls and guys, um, who, what, what, how can you add meaning to that? And how can you make sure that you can express yourself as a creative person? One of the first projects we did, which was about that, about merging this nature and technology, about creating this type of uh, techno poetry, was June. Here you see it placed in a pedestrian tunnel commissioned by the city of Rotterdam, where an old gray dark tunnel um, was sort of, uh, there was a uh, layered, a second layer added, which was called June, in order to make spaces which connect with people more and more. Although filled with technology, it more relates to an intuitive side of people, a more of playfulness. Walking by, it lights up. Or to the sound of the kids. And June has a, has a mind of its own in a way, a memory. It's still quite hectic of all the sounds. But slowly it becomes more quiet. Or here it starts to connect with people. And I thought, I think this was for us interesting because suddenly it was public space. Eh? There, there was no sign, there was no manual. We installed it within one day. People had no idea what they were looking at um, and, and intuitively started to engage with it. And also here you see technology is not there to be seen but to be experienced. So the goal was really to make something um, yeah, which, which, which we could, could relate to in a more emotional way somehow. scary sometimes as well, which is also nice. So um, this, uh, uh, what, what, what does interactive architecture, what does interactive art generate? I think that's interesting when you start making uh, these kind of uh, interactive things that um, what you want to do is not, I mean, as control freak as I am, of course you want to control a process to, to create a certain quality, but at the same time it's great to use technology to let life in, yes? And, and to, to things will happen which are outside your span of control. And actually, I think that is good. Um, this is one of the many, many things that happened within this pedestrian tunnel. This is early 2007. Uh, for me, June is about creating techno poetry, about the sensual relationship between your body and your space, and uh, about exploration. But other people, of course, have um, different interpretations such as uh, the wedding couples who um, figured out that June was on a hot spot for wedding photos, for wedding couples to have their photos taken. Uh, this is unknown to me as a, as, a, as a happy bachelor, but it appears that if you get married, you can go to a website and there are architectural locations where you can have your photos taken. And June was on number one uh, as a hotspot for, for <laughs> several months. I, I, I'm still not sure if I should consider this as a compliment, but uh, 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 they, they <laughs> They started to, uh, these wedding couples came, uh, started to make these photos and, th and they started sending me these pictures uh, with how lovely it was. It, and for them, uh, for me it was kitsch, um, um, but for them it was their moment, June reacts to their motion and to their, yeah, uh, uh, being there. Um, uh, and and, and they, they really appreciated that in that way. So what I'm trying to say is that it's good when things happen which are outside your span of control and you should embrace it and learn from it, whether you like it or not, in a way, what happens. So the, the element of touching is super important. Um, oh yeah, 
but okay, so we had a great piece, a lot of press and, and people were going crazy about it. Had this sensation of technology jumping out of the computer screen and becoming a part of your environment, of your body, of the landscapes, of the architecture. But, but what's next? And we could have easily sold June to the, made it in different colors and sold it to the media markets or the Philips or the Osrams out of there, out uh, there in the world. We had a lot of requests of, can you make it in color? Yes, we can. No, we, we don't want to. So how, how do you, um, how do you say it? How do you learn from a project like this without repeating yourself? Uh, this is always the horror of success that it becomes repetitive. And we decided to not copy paste, but to copy morph. So what I mean by that is to learn from how people interact with it, update the sensor, the behavior, the sensors, and looking at different architectural contexts to make different statements, different meanings in a way. Um, Philips would call this field research, yeah? or, or, or do a lot of uh, questionnaires with people, but we use these exhibitions to evolve the technology, make it more sensitive, and at the same time learn yeah, from, from the audience in a way. So uh, our Dutch pragmatism start kicking in, um, uh, besides the poetry, we're also pragmatic, uh, modular system, one meter by 50 centimeters, industrial plug, microchip, sensor, speaker, 10 meter in a crate, and it started to travel around the world. Um, this is a fascinating with Lucy Boulevard uh, an, an interrogation about, okay, what's the relation between sociology and technology, an event at, at the Tate Modern, um, here in a castle where Harry Potter, the latest Harry Potter was recorded, uh, still being used, the cathedral in Durham here in the UK, where the, the children, uh, the, the choir children uh, going towards the mass, uh, yeah, s s uh, played with it, and it almo almost become, it became spiritual, eh? like follow the light, or you have to believe in it, these kind of things they were telling each other. Um, but it transformed that space in a way, it made sense to do it there. Um, but one of the most fascinating, personally for me, is a permanent version we were uh, we made commissioned by the city of Rotterdam, and I'm going to zoom in a bit on this one because I think it's an important one. Um, my this is not you know Th this is Dutch Indonesia, this is Java. My great 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 aunt um, uh, in the time that the Dutch were still entrepreneurial and wanted to conquer the world, they went to Indonesia and um, yeah sort of uh, uh, dominated the locals uh, in order to uh, grow tea. They had huge tea plantages um, and then ship it back and they made a lot of money with that. Um, you, can you can discuss the moral side they have, but what they were, they were entrepreneurial people with an idea. This happened a long time ago. And my uh, family was, was part of that. Um, what is interesting in a way is what you see here is what they did they hacked the landscape, yes? So in order to grow this tea, they had to transform this jungle into, yeah, some kind of structure. So you see the lines popping up here uh, for the irrigation, eh, for the water. Um, and this is a short movie of me visiting the old garden of tea. And what I like about it is that in a way they transformed nature. They made a, a machine in order to produce a certain thing, which is called tea. And so you see, there's a jungle here, but then suddenly these lines of water irrigation start to kick in. Um, so the, 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 this weird relation between chaos and structure. More lines popping up. These are photos. It's still being used now, but now it's all from owned by the local people again. Locals. Can you see? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sort of inter interrogation of, of nature in order to produce a certain type of quality. So I consider this interesting it was the first time that something which in the past made a, made, made made meaning to me because i'm more more futuristic uh, person oriented um, maybe these kind of things are within my blood when i work on the projects that i i i have to make right now in that way i am a, a voluntary prisoner of my own imagination uh, um, and and you know you, you you what you do is figuring out what that means and produce the most excellent uh, things within that um, 
This is the location of the permanent dune we produced six months after I visit uh, the place in Java, an old dike besides the river Maas. And as you know, with dikes, as the cows are holy in India and the tigers are, uh, or the pandas are holy uh, in China, this is what dikes are in the Netherlands. You cannot do anything with them. They're, uh, you, you cannot even drill a hole or etc. cetera uh, because we live under sea level. So this is our machine in order to keep us alive. Um, but uh, we were lucky in a way that because of water level rising, a new dike had to be built uh, 200 meter land inwards. Um, so this location suddenly became available and the city of Rotterdam wanted to have a, an artwork here which would connect the people with their area, with their, with their um, community again. So we decided to build this sort of catwalk on top of it and redeveloping June with this sort of Sim City type of blocks, making it waterproof, vandalism proof. And eight months later, you get something like this. This is filmed from above, from one of the apartments uh, of the people who live there. You see people running. And it, we programmed this sort of this ghost of light, which becomes more or less active to amount of activity, either touch or sound or running. And sometimes it, sometimes ignoring you a bit. Yeah, like uh, and then people say, ah, oh, it doesn't work. And we're like, no, 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 no. Uh, you have to work. Yeah, so yes, that's always funny. Yeah. Uh, uh, don't blame technology. Uh, so you can go there at night, free entrance, open at night. Uh, Shot this two weeks ago for Tegenlicht. It's a Dutch documentary. Um, uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's a long story. Uh, <laughs> invite me back, and I'll tell you the whole story. Uh, so, so this was interesting because it was about merging this notion of social interaction, uh, of light, and and of, of new urban landscapes in a way, and making it in such a way that 60 meters would only use 60 watts. Uh, one of the biggest bottlenecks in this project, uh, a project like this always maneuvers between beauty and bullshit, uh, between the, the dream of, of, of the artist and the harsh pragmatism uh, of, 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 of a municipality and a civil servant. Uh, and one has to negotiate with that and to in intervene or to invent things. Well, what we did with this project was one of the bottlenecks is what, where would we get the electricity from because it doesn't have a zip code and the city was like, okay, yeah, how, how do we do with that? And solar panels mm, not, don't really work yet in the Netherlands, not well enough. So what we did was actually shutting down five street lights, which were already there, eh, because people are walking there at night, um, and making it in such a way that June itself would only use half the electricity of, uh, or, or, or the electricity of half a street light. Uh, therefore, the city of Rotterdam gained the electricity of 4.5 street lamps. <laughs> and then the decision was made within a week that it was okay. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you this not to be super cynical about the city of Rotterdam because it's great that they have the courage to uh, commission these kind of projects. Uh, but it shows that, you know, you have, you as a young designer or architect have to maneuver around that. Um, and that's interesting, you know, that's part of the creative process to deal with that. Uh, and it pushes you outside your comfort zone and your ABC. Um, and it pushed us a lot to make things which are more energy sufficient, energy neutral, and we'll see a project later uh, which actually generates energy. And this notion of energy generating came from the bottleneck we had here. So it's interesting how bullshit in the end can turn to beauty. Mm, also, a lot of wedding couples on this location, which I will spare you. Uh, uh, Oh yeah, and this was interesting. Uh, with these kind of high-tech environments, it's always a bit mm, exciting to, 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 you're always a bit curious. Is it still working, you know? Is it still okay? And okay, we had someone checking it out and it was vandalism proof and people take care of it, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, and sometimes I visit it, but I was always a bit, you know, curious about that. In, in a, um, so what my head of technology, Peter de Man, did, because he noticed that, that I was uh, slightly nervous about it, because it's a big project, first time. So what he did was developing an SMS function, a June SMS function. So every week, June sends me an SMS on my mobile phone, how it's doing, how many sensors are triggered, how many children are playing with it, how many bloody wedding couples have been passed by, and, <laughs> and I can... Uh, change different thresholds or certain moods in behavior, such as touching or walking or idle, I can make them more or less sensitive, eh? so some uh, settings will occur less or more. And it's a fascinating way that suddenly the artwork starts talking back to you, and I have some kind of control over it. And, you know, it creates all these weird scenarios that, that you're having lunch with, with your girlfriend, and suddenly uh, your phone gets all these SMSs, she asks uh, who it is, I say it's the artwork, she doesn't believe me, uh, and uh, we get into a fight, and uh, yeah, it, I love it, yeah, I love it, yeah. So um, uh, this is uh, the, 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 the team, because of course I'm not doing these kind of things alone, yeah? the, the notion of a sort of brilliant Van Gogh artist sitting in an attic cutting off little pieces of his or her ear is, is, is old sentiment, and I, I think also not realistic, um, in that way, I feel more related, well, like, 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 like you guys at the architectural offices or a Rubens or a Rembrandt, groups of people with a certain type of craftsmanship where, which you want to connect to a vision and that, that there's a sort of desire for excellence within that. Um, so this is Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, what is it? 12, 13 people now. Uh, architects, designers, software engineers, electronic uh, people, uh, but also fashion and together we work on a series uh, of artworks of interactive landscapes I'm showing you. And a second studio in Shanghai uh, where we focus more on the larger scale uh, projects. So this is one of our largest friends, the, the, the microchip. Yeah, so the behavior and the, the soul somehow is within this. Uh, yeah, the price almost less than one US dollar. But it's incredibly important and we spend a lot of time, money and energy on developing our own technology. So a, a painter has paint, well, we have this uh, little friend, and it makes sure that it remains sensitive and it also remains, um, that, it, yeah, that, has this, that by spending a lot of time on it, we're able to master it and, and perform it in a way that I want to. Uh, oh yeah, and we steal from the right people, also very important. <laughs> I, I always miss that in this architectural debate, uh, uh, that, that, hey, that like, uh, creating and stealing, they have a weird relationship. Uh, so we should definitely uh, address that topic maybe in the next uh, session. Um, and this sort of smart materials. Uh, this is Lotus. Based on the, the 37 degrees, the heat of your breath, it folds open like a flower. This is what, what I do the whole day. The, uh, yeah. so, <laughs> I love my job. Uh, and this is... <laughs> Uh, and this is a secret project. Um, w the heat of your hand transforms the color uh, transforms the color of 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 of, of, yeah, of the skin in a way, turning from red to white. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this, but uh, I, I thought it was interesting to show. Hmm. So, but in the end, it's of course not about technology. It's not about the medium, it's about the message, or at least trying to combine them and making a statement about how do we want our future uh, worlds to look like, what does technology want from us, what do we want from technology, and what's the poetry within that. And, you know, as a young design firm, it's great to be successful uh, with this piece like June, but I already explained the horror is to copy-paste. So what we started doing is self-commissioning ourselves, and what it means is that you start projects without client, without budget, without context, and you do it anyway because you think it's important. Um, intimacy is a project exactly like that, where we wanted to merge human emotion with technology and apply it to a discipline which at that time we were completely unfamiliar with, at complete, as, as geeks of course, which was fashion. Uh, and teaming up with an electronic paper manufacturer uh, in which we developed a material which can change in transparency when we address it in a certain way, um, and started to make dresses out of it.
So based on the touch, you see it changes from white to transparent or here to the heartbeat of the model. So the more excited she becomes, the more, well, yeah. I'll, I'll leave it to ima your imagination, but. <laughs> Uh, uh, what was interesting in a way was first of all the, 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 the creative breakthrough in the studio. You should imagine that we have all these slightly autistic geeks uh, behind laptops and working with me and me, you know, playing with these materials the whole day. Uh, and suddenly we had all these this, this beautiful fashion uh, models uh, on their high heels walking by. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so it, it was this weird, I walked into the studio one day and it was this weird zoo almost uh, thing. But, but, but they started communicating. You know, they started to talk, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I thought that was really good. So they said, like, to the geek, like, ah, this sensor, it's too bulky, and, you know, what's this battery doing here? I don't like that. So in a way, um, and then they explained that, okay, yeah, there's a battery uh, duty cycle, blah, blah, blah. So, but it, this discussion sort of pushed the design in t towards a way um, which, uh, yeah, I could have never done alone. Um, so we decided to team up with young Dutch fashion designers. So we invited fashion uh, designers uh, to work with us on a new series. This is the 2.0 more wearable going from black to transparent. So this notion of, of dynamic skins in a way. <coughs> also connected to the heartbeat. and white. We have a version that it reacts only to the voice of your boyfriend if you wear it. <laughs> Which creates weird situations of co-control. <laughs> That's true love for me. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but all jokes aside, um, I think it's interesting, we're looking at this bloody uh, Facebook iPhone screen the whole day. Is this communication? Is this social media? I don't think so. Um, technology will jump out of that computer screen and become part of our body and our architecture, whether we like it or not. And I think it's the role of, of, of us to make proposals of how we can make that more um, appealing. Uh, this is a project ongoing. Right now, we, after two years of working on it, we have a client, which is also interesting because it creates a sort of framework. One of the things we're going to do is actually make a suit for men, which becomes transparent uh, when you lie. <laughs> I think that, that would be, uh, because the client is for the bank world. I, I, I haven't uh, proposed it yet, I will do that next week. I'm not sure if they're gonna like it, but, uh, 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 but a lot, one can only imagine if you apply these kind of principles to architectural facades, yes, where you can show or hide uh, things in a very functional way or more in a more experimental way. Um, something we'll talk about a bit less, uh, a bit more later on. Oh yeah, and this is, um, uh, yeah, maybe you don't know her. Uh, this is our upcoming Royal Highness, our queen, uh, the person in the middle. And here you see me uh, talking to her and I'm convincing her that if she, if we would make a royal version for her and she would wear it, she would be one of the most innovative people in the world. And as you can see, the look on her face, she is slightly scared, slightly fascinated. So we, we have something uh, to talk about that anyway. Okay, the notion, uh, um, enough about that. In the notion of skins has always uh, been uh, with me. Um, this is an old piece we did in the, in the, in the Ice Palace, the, the white uh, city hall museum, of a uh, city hall, The Hague, from Richard Meyer, yes? Commissioned by the city hall. Now, okay, you know it, eh? this, this, this sort of puristic white grid. Uh, so we said, okay, we'll do the opposite. We'll make a dynamic dark blue purple grid of thousands of ventilators which start rotating when you walk by, creating this new way of, of cooling, eh, of air conditioning, but at the same time creating these beautiful patterns yeah, sort of, sort of, sort of, almost animals, which when you walk by start to change. Very thin, yeah, so all the technology is embedded. And these are people on their way to work, or yeah. This was also based on the frustration I have with this Jean Nouvel Arabic Institute uh, piece. <laughs> 50,000 of little mechanism which never work. I think we should make that more, with all due respect, of course, with his great, uh, for his great uh, firm, uh, seriously. But 
Um, I think we should make it more organic, more natural somehow. Mm. And these were the first in explorations in it. It, was, it won a Dutch Design Award, and in the jury report, which I by accident saw, uh, they said it was one of the best non-functional designs they've ever seen, which I, I thought it was a compliment. So this new way of, of, of thinking about interactive architecture using very basic uh, principles. Mm. This is an important one uh, because this was in the back of my brain when I was working on this project. Uh, the city of Lille in France contacted us and they had a problem because they have a lot of beautiful old monuments which they spent a lot of money on, uh, but they either are shut down or nobody visits them. Uh, so they asked us to make an intervention which would reconnect the architecture, the old architecture, with the people who live there. Um, and to create a sort of more contemporary experience uh, for, for the people of today. This was the briefing. And after walking through the city, we choose this location. This is the Sainte Marie Madeleine Church, Renaissance Church, uh, which was in need of heavily uh, renovation. And we decided to place this there. I'll show you the moon. Lotus Dome. When you walk by, the light follows you. Therefore, the, uh, the, the heat-sensitive foil folds open. Oh, yeah, it was me again. Yes. Sort of by unfolding, letting the light go through, literally sort of scanning the building. So suddenly you, you see it in a new way, closing when nobody's there, sort of hiding and showing these, these angels, connecting people. And I thought that, in a way, I feel I have this incredible urge to, to update reality. Uh, June did that in a way near the Maas Tunnel or near, near the river. Um, but it's also important to think about cultural heritage. What do all these old buildings mean, you know, especially in a city like London? How do you deal with that? And how do you drag that into a more contemporary experience? Um, and, and in a way, that, that is what this project is about. And when I was preparing, in a way, the, 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 the lecture for you guys, uh, this was sent to me by a friend, um, a note of Buckmuller Fuller. Uh, this was in his notebook. Um, and he says, if industry was to take it on, there are things that we could do um, that could articulate by photosynthesis and so forth, could let light in and out, create a very high frequency where each, each of the no, this is not it. One could be a screen, others breathing air, others letting light in, and the whole thing could articulate just as sensitively as a human being skin. And this was a note he made in 1971. And I think it's incredibly fascinating that, that in a way, that the things that he was working on, um, yeah, we, we, we can, we can with, the, with the new means which are out there for, for you and, uh, and us all, uh, for, for you and I, all of us, um, we can push that to sort of next level. Right now we're taking it from art to architecture. These are the first renders for an architectural facade we're working on for a large fashion chain, um, a brand, where we work on different thicknesses of the material. So based on the sunlight, it folds open. Some parts are interactive, most of them are responsive. And some parts are thicker and thinner than others. So when the sun hits it, Certain parts, like left above, will open very rapidly, and others take much, much longer to uh, uh, fold open, creating a sort of no-tech animated surface. Um, architecture as a flower, not so much as a metaphor, but actually with, within its performance. And this is one of the architects playing with the, the samples based on the heat of his, uh, of his hand. 
and this is um, uh, part of the entrance we're working on, a sort of gigantic dome shape. Okay. Um, we've been talking about interactivity and technology and evolution and innovation and how to connect human beings towards that. A lot of the project indeed we do is include light. And it was interesting because one day we got a call from a client uh, who commissioned us a project in the area where light bulb was made, not invented, but developed, which was an old Philips factory area in Eindhoven, it's called Stripe S. And they commissioned us actually to uh, develop something next level uh, light bulb in a way. Huh? What's the next step of lighting in which they want to include social media with, with, with public functional lighting. And so we started to look, uh, this is still in development, but I can show you some first uh, footage. Uh, what's the essence of light? Well, in the beginning it was super personal. You were carrying it with you, eh? it was like a candle. And then it became industrialized and you had these huge teal pillars in order to show light. And then in 1962, the invention of the LED, it became much smaller, much cheaper, less uh, energy, etc. So what is next in that? Well, we propose this in which we say light is not so much um, connected to all this hardware with pillars and cables and, 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 and remote controls and all these things. It should be more fluid, it should be more playful. And what you see here is actually a salt crystal which we dipped in a substance. Um, when you do that in the right chemical way, it starts to grow in perfectly geometrical shapes. It's super nice, you don't have to do anything yourself. It sort of literally grows uh, while, you're, while you're feeding it. Um, we put an LED in it and creating a weak magnetic field in the, in the, in the black power mat that you see, it charge, it gets its electricity wirelessly. Similar, I'm, I'm simplifying it now, but similar to the principle of your, of your toothbrush, uh, this induction uh, thing. And therefore suddenly light becomes playful. Uh, there's no battery in it, so you can pick it up, you can write letters with it. This is one of the first prototypes that we made, a large circle. This is in Amsterdam, in the Eye Museum. And this is what happened. People started, besides where you walk there's light, eh, so it's functional. They started making all these symbols and these hearts or these letters. So it's sort of a, a Lego from Mars in a way. Uh, but suddenly your environment becomes more full again. It starts to personalize. And the interactivity is that the more you, you touch them, the more active or, or bright the light becomes. And of course, people steal them, <laughs> which is good. Uh, in a way, it reminded me of the white bicycle plan. I don't know what well, your parents will know. There was this the, the old hippie area in the Netherlands where they said, okay, everything is uh, uh, from everyone. So they started to paint bicycles white and everybody could use them. Um, well, that worked for a couple of months and of course, yeah, they were also stolen. But the principle of shareability, yeah, when you, uh, that you exchange and based on that you can create a value which is beyond the individual, is something which is for me about true interaction. Yes, interaction is not a sensor, you walk by and something happens, whatever, that's Atari. I think the real interaction happens between people and the way you exchange things. And what was interesting with this project is that uh, we made different ones, but the ones who, how do I say it right? Um, the ones who her, were uh, very few of, these were the ones which were stolen. <laughs> so if you make 95% out of these ones and only four blue ones, it doesn't matter if they're more beautiful or ugly, in my opinion, the, the, the one which is different gets, gets stolen. Um, <laughs> And of course, we, 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 my, my hope is that you steal it to give it to your girlfriend and then you can come back and, and you can have some collective moment eh, that it's about place making. And otherwise, yeah, I think we'll make a version that we, we put a GPS uh, in it and, it, <laughs> and, you, and you, get a, you get a nice little invoice in one year later. Yeah, no, I'm joking. But um, what it does is, is uh, this is the proposal for the, the Philips location. So 200 meter, thousands of these crystals where you walk by, they light up, and at the same time, different sizes. 
and, and yeah, it, it, it is going to be super interesting to see uh, what's going to happen there, how people are going, are going to articulate uh, their landscape. Toyota, a sponsor of green design. Talking about energy. Every time we take a step, we leave energy behind. What if we could capture this energy as a clean source of electricity? Dutch architects so are developing the technology to capture the energy of dancers like these, then using it to power the club's music and lights. Certain materials produce electricity when squeezed. This is known as the piezo effect. So a dance floor can become one big generator, turning every movement into new power. In fact, any vibrations we make can generate electricity. Even the rattle of the tram taking you home at the end of the night. Green Design, sponsored by Toyota. So um, we developed the first one. The movie you saw was uh, released in the first week that we started. So a lot of people thought this project already was realized, and a lot of project thought, uh, a lot of people thought it could never be done. And we still had to start. We had a deadline of 10 months, but we teamed up with some great engineers and uh, built the first one for a club in Rotterdam. So it's an energy harvesting part, five centimeter thick, a nine millimeter movement creates 20, 25 watts in an interface tile which gives you the illusion that the more you dance, the more depth it creates. Therefore, you really have the feeling that you're charging the floor. We didn't want to use with fact sheets or letters. Um, so it's an element of mirrors and LEDs. So top part, nobody's there, quite shallow. Uh, when people dance a lot, it gets more depth. Um, and the tile itself produces only, produces 20, 25 watts asks only one watt, so we have a lot of power left for the DJ booth or lighting or whatever you want to charge up your iPhone. Or, um, but a fascinating way of saying sustainability is not just about placing windmills on a roof and, and uh, driving an electrical car also, but I think we should do much, much more than that and really make it an, an integral, in, integral layer of our, of, our, of our lives. In this case, people are already dancing they're already you know, throwing away energy. Why not just do something with that? But also much, much more to merge innovation within a certain way of experience. Um, that it's actually, yeah, yeah, you get something in return of it. It becomes a relational network. And while this project was uh, traveling around the world, we made several of them. Uh, I remember very vividly the moment I was sitting in a car on a highway driving around and thinking about new type of landscapes. And suddenly this image of the roads start to pop up with me because roads are completely gray, b b uh, white, black, very boring. We spend billions on them. They hack our landscapes into little pieces. They have a huge influence. I, I actually think in some cities in Asia, but also in Los Angeles, roads determine more how a city looks like than, than actual architecture or buildings but somehow the architect or the designer is absent within that area. So we started to think, can we make them more interactive? Can we make them more sustainable? And uh, doing some research, uh, we found a lot of inventions out there hidden inside a drawer, uh, such as dynamic lighting or getting uh, induction, uh, getting power from the road, et cetera, et cetera. And I started to talk about it, giving lectures uh, like, like this uh, for the innovation uh, fairs which are out there. And one day we were lucky because what I didn't know at that time was that the directors of Heimans were in the audience, one of the biggest road manufacturers in the Netherlands. Um, and they called me uh, the next day on my mobile phone and asked me a very basic, almost banal question that you will encounter as well um, when you are full with a great enough idea. People will call you and ask you, how much? <laughs> <laughs> Which is very frustrating and very good at the same time. It, 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 it's sort of a compliment in their world. Um, uh, well, at that time we didn't know. Uh, so what we did do was team up with them and sign a contract for the coming three years in which I convinced them that they have to pay for a process, not for a product, yes? So I don't want them to buy one thing and then go away. No, 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 no. I want to get into their brains, you know? I want to know things about roads. I want to understand it, the problems, 
Um, and this is on the rooftop of, of, of the headquarters there in the Netherlands, to the right, the, one of the directors uh, of Heimans, and to, well, to the left, the artist who talks a lot. Um, uh, and together, we teamed up, and it's sort of a West Side story, in a way, of two gangs who don't really belong to each other. He has never been into, uh, into a museum in his life. I know that for a fact. And I have no idea how you would build a road. But it doesn't matter. We agree that we disagree. And we have a common love, which is the innovation of the Dutch landscape. And I think that sort of was, 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 was a key moment. Um, applying now the designs we have within existing roads in the coming two to three years, so this is not just a wet dream of an, of an artist uh, in 10, 15 years, it's about within the now. Um, this, for example, is dynamic paint, paint which changes in color based on temperature. So the road shows these sort of snow flocks when it's cold, so you can see where it's slippery or not. Um, so the road becomes an interface, I'm warm, I'm cold, I'm old, I'm new. Uh, or these ones, uh, lighting, uh, developing this glow-in-the-dark light, which you all know as, as, a, as a boy or, uh, or as a girl with toys, or pushing it to an almost radioactive level uh, uh, that it would charge at daytime and give light at night, and therefore you can skip away street lighting and you get this amazing Tron-like uh, highways as well. Um, this is also super relevant because within the UK, but also in the Netherlands, government, an existing system is crashing. Government is shutting down street lights to save money. Um, uh, therefore, the, the casualties of death go up uh, around 4%. And I think that's incredibly wrong. I think we should do more, we shouldn't do less, and we should use the existing creativity and, and young ideas which we have in this audience today uh, to, to, to hack, to update the world around us. Prototypes in action. Apology for the soundtrack, but yeah, this is your BBC. So, yeah. um, so here you see the going from white to color. Oh yeah, and this one sort of uh, lines, so you can cross them or not. You can do that with, with a little uh, change in currency. And we speed up the sunlight if you want to know. Uh, charge glowing time around eight hours. And one of my favorites as well, induction priority lane saying electrical cars are nice but are still a bit clumsy. Uh, let's make a road which charge your car automatically when you drive on it, doable. Um, the interesting part is and maybe we don't have time for this now, is that besides all the great technologies and, and designs which you can do with it, it's a process of transformation. Suddenly a very old-fashioned conservative road manufacturer is interested in design. Why? You know, why cannot, can, can they not do that then for themselves? No. Uh, this is the role of the designer to merge this craftsmanship with a vision. Um, and especially in a time like this where, where architects either seem to be forced to this sort of uh, star iconic, uh, uh, boring thing, or being a sort of advisory in, in a corner. It's incredibly important to, 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 to connect with people and to convince them that don't pay for product, but pay for process, uh, and, and, and you will get much, much more out of that. Okay, last thing, and then we open the, the audience for questions. We've been talking about technology and landscapes, but also cultural heritage, and this is important to know that as I'm Dutch, I live under sea level, so I need technology to survive, otherwise we would drown. Um, when you look at them, these windmills, they seem sentiment, yeah? they seem cultural heritage. People go there to have photos taken, etc., etc. It's almost this, this poetic uh, notion. But of course they are not. That's not why they were made. These are landscape machines in order to keep the level of the water right. Um, so you see that, 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 that technology and our emotion have a weird connection, and there's a lot to be explored about that. We were commissioned by a large uh, manufacturer in the Netherlands producing the new type of windmills, and they asked us, can you not help us? Because we think this is good, this is new energy, yeah? uh, less oil, we want wind energy. But people always complain that they're ugly, they don't want to have it in their backyard. You know, can, can, you, can we work with you to make a new icon about that in a way. And I thought it was an interesting question, so we teamed up with them and looking at the windmills and saying that, okay, we're not going to decorate them with LEDs, we're not going to try to make them look more prettier or, or 
focus on the shape, but let's focus on the behavior. And when you look at a windmill, and you have 10 or 12 or 15 in a row, they all move a little bit different, <laughs> which drives the engineers crazy, eh, because they want to have it, but the wind is a little bit different, or, or the M5 is M5.5, eh, so there's a sort of an intonation, there's, there, there, there's, a, there's, there's a difference between them. And I thought, I said, okay, yes, we do that. We focus on, on, the, on, the, on what is different. We focus on the in-between. And literally creating, uh, this is in development, a 7.5 kilometer light artwork where we connect the tipping points of the windmills with lines based on the amount of uh, wind, more or less lines will appear. So sometimes very quiet like this. So you get this, uh, you know, I almost did nothing, huh? I just drew a line. Lit yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, like, come on, come on, guys. Yeah, they're like, yeah, uh, but maybe that's good. Um, maybe in that way we should do less, not more, but yeah. yeah. So this sort of matrix-like shapes. Hmm. Yeah, soft icons. All right, to, to conclude. Ah, I'm, I'm, I'm starting with pandas, I'm ending with tigers. I mean, um, this is a story, a, co a conclusive uh, story, of which I have, in my opinion, have been talking about in the last 60 minutes, about true love, about true interactivity, about true shareability, and about being a true hybrid, which I think we all should become. Um, tigers are also slightly holy in India. And this was a story I experienced when I was traveling around Mumbai, where the tiger had five little puppies, but these five little puppies, they died when they were born in the zoo. And the tiger got very depressed, didn't want to eat anymore, and the caretakers got very scared that she would die. And so what they did is they came up, <laughs> they came up with a design, yeah, with an idea. And so what they did is they took five little piggies, because they're more or less the same size and widely available. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and took the skin of the five little puppies, which died, wrapped it around them, and put them in a cage and waited. And a miracle happened. Huh? The tiger accepted them as they're newly born, got the happier, started to eat, and as you can see, they live happily together right now. I think... I think this is what we should be doing. We should merge the worlds of innovation and experience. We should connect medium with message. We should move beyond the Yamar attitude and come up with new proposals of how we want to deal with reality in which, yes, we are making things, we are designing things, but in a weird little way, the making will also <laughs> make us. Thank you. If you, thank you. If you, if you want to share, steal, or download everything I just show, you can go here. Questions? Please. Hello. Can Hello. you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Um, I like your work. Um, the project's in Lille. Uh, you made an intervention, yeah. and you did bring people in, but it's almost as if you brought people in to see your thing. Where the pictures you showed were people interacting with your installation, mm -hmm. but did they start to look at the the building it was in in a different light? Yeah, well, I, that that was um, interesting. That so, for example, these angels, uh, these stone angels, which you saw in the movie, yeah, this this shot, because we hit them, yeah, it was dark, and because you, when you interacted, the light started to fall on the building, people suddenly start to look around again. So here we actually, you're absolutely right, we started to hide the architecture in order to make it only visible when you would interact with it. Um, uh, and I thought, I thought that was an interesting approach. Yeah. 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 So it was not just about the artwork, I hope not. Yeah, well, you can, you can for, I can imagine within a more a larger architectural facade setting, that you make it less object eh, and more skin? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
but they're French. They want an object. Ha 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 ha! I didn't say that. Yeah. yeah okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, as you can see, um, uh, I, 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 I like metaphors, I like humor, not so much to be funny, but because I'm hoping to get some uh, response from you guys. Eh? I over, I've always learned to never take myself too serious because it turns out that you're going to make really boring work out of it. Um, so, yeah, please, next question. John, have you seen Monk Uh, Mont Saint Michel and Brittany, we were there in August, mm -hmm. and they did a super, super job on <coughs> repurposing an old monastery with great light sound installations, live uh, musicians. Yeah. They were French again, so they had to be beautiful 20 year old uh, sort of musicians. Okay. And it was um, well worth it because otherwise it looked pretty kitsch, yeah. but inside yeah. it was yeah. really yeah. spectacular, well worth looking at. Yeah, I think that's incredibly fascinating that, 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 that how can you update, how can you can, um, add another layer to the world around you? Instead, yeah, yeah. Instead of saying we have to build something new, let's deal with the old and drag it into the now. Wow, you know, like, like, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Please. Um, so I had two questions. One question was more f more fun than the other, so I figure out I'll we try can for be the serious, funny one. Please, yeah. Um, and so for the last image you're showing, um, how how is the um, the thing attached on the little pig? And if one day you imagine that the, he, he loses his skin, do you think the result of the, of the denial of the, uh, of the parent would uh, have mm -hmm. been worth uh, making this experiment? Yeah, I think, you're, you, I think it's a good question. I'm still wondering, am I the caretaker, am I the pi tiger, or am I the piggy uh, within that, as a designer? Um, um, I don't know. I don't, and I cannot answer that, uh, your question. I think, I don't know, I think the tiger knows, but he's just playing along. <laughs> but uh, he's like, okay, okay, caretaker. Okay, I'll give you, I'll, you know, I'll, but, but um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it works. And I think when you talk about the world today, when we look at uh, resources going down eh, with sustainability, you see that, uh, that the system is crashing. And nobody really knows how to deal what's next. And we get into this ya yeah, mar and this, oh, we, there's no money. Uh, and this sort of, I think that's incredibly wrong. And what I think we should be doing is create the missing link. Almost everything is already out there. It's just a question of, and, and again, drawing the line. Yeah. And if it's well connected to the piggy, I, I, yeah, well let's, let's find out. Yeah. <laughs> what was your second question? Yeah, uh, okay. you, you can uh, have two. Uh, how did you uh, discover the material that is folding with the heat? Mm. And when you discovered that, did you put any patent, or how did it? How did you deal with the idea? Well, the, the lotus foil was actually based on a very natural principle. Everything shrinks and expands when it becomes warm or cold. This building does it. Our body does it. This 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 piece of wood does it. Um, so and there's already a bimetal, which is very expensive. Takes a lot of energy to to uh, to move. I thought it was incredibly clumsy, so I didn't like that, but I liked the principle. Um, so what we did actually was, was, was thinking, can we not make that into a more mylar, a more, more plastic type of thing? Um, and I asked some manufacturers and they said, yeah, well, well, yeah, no, n yeah, we don't know why it's not there. I'm like, okay, so, you know, let's find out. Um, so that's that, it's a very basic principle. You, you can actually, you know, try it out yourself. Um, we patented it. But at the same time, yeah, um, how do I say that? Mm, I, think, I think, you know, it's, it, people are already trying to copy it, um, but if they want the real thing, they were gonna co they're going to call us anyway. So yeah, we do it, but at the same time, you don't want to have the situation where we patented everything, and therefore other people can never work with it. So for example, for the crystal, eh, with the coil and the LED, we open it. So when it's there in Eindhoven, everyone can make its own crystal. Either you know, make it handmade or, or, or 3D print a glass one. Or, or uh, we were teaming up with Swarovski to make a 10,000 euro one as well. <laughs> really good. And, and, and you know, just you know, open it up. Open it up and see what happens. But you know, I want to share ideas, not technology. This is sort of, yeah, okay, I can tell you what, what Lotus Foy is. And so what? You know, what are you going to do then? So, uh, I think the crystal was interesting that we literally say, okay, let's open up 
uh, open source in a way that's not just information, but it's about ideas. Yeah. And what does that mean for architecture uh, and public space? Yeah. How does Facebook Square look like? Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's, that's a whole new field to be explored. Yeah, super interesting. Please. Um, yeah, I was saying, yeah, we can see you still from NASA and stuff to get all your new technology, but I was just wondering whether or not the, you get the new technology and then you create an art or you know, create an interactive piece from that, or do you come up with an idea first and then try and find the technology for it? Yeah, the question was, I don't know if you could hear it, is like either idea first or material first, yes? Oh, okay. I did it right. Um, uh, yeah. Do you have the idea first, or do you find the technology first? Well, it's, I think it starts with ideology. It starts with saying that we want to make a world which is not static, which is open, and we, wanted to make, we want to use technology to make environments more self-sustainable, either in an emotional state or, or in, a, in an energy state of being. Um, so you should see it in such a way that it's partly based on my personal obsessions, which vary from time to time, and it's partly based on a great group of people in the studio who keep on coming with new ideas, and I don't care if it's from the intern or from our head of design, uh, producing an enormous amount of models, of prototypes, of, 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 of figuring out materials. So it definitely starts with the idea, but of course the process of making starts to influence that. Like, like the lotus was there, but the lotus was meaningless until I put it into the context of the church in Lille, where, where suddenly it connects with this old world. So I think that's design. It's about media, but also about message. Uh, don't try to glamorize um, the material, because it will be outdated in five to ten years. Yeah? That's why we don't do screens, because I don't believe in it. I, you and I won't be looking at screens in ten years. No way. Yeah, it's either you know, here or here, or we don't do it at all anymore. Yeah? Um, but try to hack it, try to master it in order that it expresses the emotion you have in your in your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, basically, as technology is becoming the maker of body and it's not anymore an extension to the body, no. who's responsible for making it meaningful? We all are. Um, it's Marshall McLuhan, uh, at Spacecraft Earth, there are no passengers, we are all crew. Um, you're right, in the beginning, we always use technology as an extension of what we do. Eh? The, our, the wheel is an extension of our legs, the glass is an extension of our eyes, uh, the pan is an extension of our hands, in a way, to, to cook food. But you're absolutely right, it, it, it seems like it's being pushed much, much further. Eh? Facebook wants things from us, it gets a mind of its own. And within that, that's also where, where it's not a technology thing, but an ideology thing. There can be George Orwell eh, to dominate, to control, to reduce human diversity. But there can also be Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, we can learn how to fly. We can cure diseases. Uh, Ray Kurzweil is talking about that as well. And, and yeah, I mean, you already know on which scenario I'm, I'm, I'm hinting. Um, but this is something we're going to build up together. Yeah, yeah. This, this is up to you guys as well to decide. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Hi. Uh, in, at, at one point in the presentation, you said that you stopped uh, waiting to get commissioned, and you just had an idea. You started working on it. But my, I was just wondering how you actually fund that because you're running yeah. a practice as well. So how does that really happen? Well, it it varies. Of course, you you need to have one very successful project, which which gives you that freedom. Um, uh, uh, robbing old ladies on a Sunday evening helps. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, like, like if you, yeah, this sounds cliche, but if you do something you believe in, you will find a way to make it happen, you know? But maybe it's good to tell short the story of intimacy. The material that we used was very, very expensive, is very expensive. And the, the director of the electronic paper manufacturer in Israel, which we work with, um, was willing to send some samples. Okay, nice. But then we wanted more, and he was like, okay, just come back when you order like 100 kilometer of it, eh, like a lot. And of course, we were not in that position. But then suddenly the, the value of soft capital, not hard capital, what you were addressing to, but soft capital start kicking in. Because intimacy became famous. It was written on all the blogs and the magazines, and, and, the, and it, it changed something in the fashion scene. And the wife of the director of that company was a big fashion addict. 
and she saw it online. Yeah, the true story. She saw it online, and she said, "Hey, why are you not working with them anymore? You know, make it happen." So he called me as well on my phone. Said, yeah, my wife tells me you have to work together. <laughs> true story, and that 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 pushed the process to a next phase. So sometimes you have a lot of budget. And sometimes you have very little. This is part of the package, you know. You have to be this half priest, half entrepreneur, yeah, to believe in something. But at the same time, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't wait until somebody comes to help you. Are you crazy? Like you have to do it yourself. I've always had people telling me that what I want could not be done, and and it's sort of my job to to prove them wrong. Yeah. So to answer your question pragmatically for you guys, yeah, I, because I can think, hear you thinking. Um, um, invest in your dreams, you know, make prototypes, you know, be clear on the vision, not on the materials, and find different partners. Either, you know, you get samples from materials or you convince someone to help you, um, uh, and sooner or later you will, you will. But this is part of the creative process. Eh? This is the beauty and the bullshit, have a relationship. So don't just, you know, cut it away and stay in your comfort zone. You will, you will really start making boring stuff. But you're right, I think in the beginning, I, I 50, 60% of my time I spent on, on this process. Yeah, 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 yeah that, was, that, was, that was hardcore. But now it's, it's more, more freestyle. But, <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, you know, it, 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 uh, I, think, I think it was good. Next question. Yeah. yeah. You're from India or no? Yeah, yeah okay, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you, you don't, you, you knew this, this story or not? Yeah, 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 I visit, yeah. <laughs> Check it out, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next question, please. Um, how, how do you contextualize your work with the uh, already ex existing architecture? Because mm -hmm. your first work obviously very, like, merged, we merged well with the landscape, but if you think about the ventilation in the city hall, yeah. or like, the work on that Leo, like, because mm -hmm. it might, you might not really, uh, how do you relate your work with the space? Because m it might really, like, mm, not respond, it's not really responding to space, re responding to people. Yeah, oh, that's a good comment. Yeah, but then again, space is about people and about their, rela their dynamic relationship with people. So the way I choose it is that, that I ask myself, okay, what do I want to keep? And what do I want to change? Yes? So some things are variable and some things are invariable. So for example, in Lille, I wanted to show the angels again. Yes? So I had to make it dark to show. Or in the Meyer building, I wanted to show that the grid can also be more open. Yeah? So I started to open it up. Um, um, and you, of course, you look at people. What do they do there? You know, what, what do you want to generate in a way? Yeah, but you're absolutely right. These are quite intuitive uh, decisions uh, being made. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's why, I mean, I did a master architecture. I have always thought architecture was the field to explore these kind of things. And when you talk about innovative design and sustainability and interactivity, because this is, you are all programmers. Yeah, the moment you say, this is space, this is door, this is sleeping area, this is uh, voyeur, you already start programming in a way. But now, with this whole new age of materials and new ideas, this becomes much more fluid, much more flexible, in a way the Archigan people could have never imagined it. So, uh, yeah. So maybe that would be super interesting uh, in four to five months, that, that I, I talk, listen to you guys telling me what Facebook Square uh, should look like, eh? or, or how can we connect this virtual and this real world again. I think there, there's an incredible challenge in that. Yeah. Okay, last question. Thanks. Uh, well, most of uh, your work, um, I think it works with one channel of uh, communication. Like I see that uh, the technology or the object or the architecture uh, communicates with the humans. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we react to that. Yeah. But I'm wondering if you have think uh, about uh, getting feedback, feedback from us in order that the 
mm, technology or the object or the design could react to that and learn from that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, g I get this uh, weekly SMS from you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it could be like this what? because the reality for the tiger, it's different and he's learning from that or maybe mm -hmm. he's just acting. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. from the piggies, mm -hmm. it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So yeah, That's a good comment. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's why I like crystal so much, eh? the, the crystals, the little yeah, yeah. Uh, lead rocks, because I literally took the part of June, which I liked, which was the top, <laughs> <laughs> and I made it flexible, you know? I mean, I'd be like, okay, just share it, you know? Just do whatever you want to do. So you're absolutely right. How can you create authentic experiences, which are restrained, eh? let's put mm -hmm. it like that. They are, they are sort of within a certain frame. And at the same time, make something which is open, open enough for people to, to hack, to influence. Yeah. And so, like, for example, a, s a book is a story with a clear beginning and an end. It's super specific. But a conversation is super open, super generic. You and I have no idea what we're going to talk about it in one minute. You know, we can, yeah, yeah. It's open. So one, as a designer, you have to balance what do you want to keep variable and what do you want to keep invariable. Um, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's also the discussion with Apple and Android, you know, the same, same thing. You want a closed, perfect machine, or you want something open, which is a bit more messy? Yeah, that, 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 that's a good question. And this is, it, you have to be very careful within that in the design process, because it will determine the behavior of the piece enormously. And um, if you do it wrong, it becomes decorative, beautiful, but boring. Mm. And if you do it right, it becomes interactive, and hopefully it will change itself. Yeah. But you're right, I think uh, mm, that's why I'm saying sharing. I think sharing is more interesting than interacting, or this word interactive, um, than the shareability, the moment you really change something. I think Facebook is not about sharing, it's just about showing. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> yeah, ah, I do this, I lecture at A, yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay, so when do we really, uh, when do we really connect? Uh, well, uh, yeah, the way it still very, it feels very clumsy. And these are sort of hints proposals of how our future could look like, but for sure it's uh, something we're going to definitely uh, figure out together. Yeah. What do you think is the role of the architect within that? I can ask questions as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so, yeah. I mean, I, I found this very encouraging. Uh, Good. I, I kind of uh, admire what you're doing, and yeah, I mean, what we are talking about, like these tigers, yeah, could be uh, a good future from that. Like, it's not only an experience for us, but also for the architecture. And of course, it's there is a feedback there, like yeah. a loop. And you look at history. Yeah, there, there's Archigam, there's Spuilbroek, there's Oosterhuis, there's the Jean Nouvel. A lot of uh, interactive, innovative, and responsive architecture. But uh, yeah, these are baby steps, including my work, are baby steps towards what what can be much, much more. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cheers, guys. See you next time.